and welcome once again to Strange Planet. On this episode, we're going to explore our emergence as self-aware members of a planetary home and entire universe that is unified and innately sentient entity. Dr. Jude Curvin is a cosmologist, futurist, planetary healer, member of the Evolutionary Leaders Circle, and previously one of the most senior business women in the United Kingdom. She has a master's degree in physics from Oxford University and a doctorate in archaeology from the University of Reading. She's traveled extensively, worked with wisdom keepers from many traditions, and is a lifelong researcher into the nature of reality. She's the author of six books, including The Cosmic Hologram and her latest, The Story of Gaia, The Big Breath and the Evolutionary Journey of Our Conscious Planet. Dr. Curvin, welcome. How are you? Richard, thank you for inviting me. I'm very well, thank you. And, and um, I'm very cognizant that this is Thanksgiving Day in the US. So for all the folks that are with us, either now or later, happy Thanksgiving. All right. Thank you very much. I'm actually in Canada. Um, I'd understood that. Just we, uh, we celebrate our Thanksgiving in October. Uh, so, oh. uh, But of course, m many of my listeners are, are American, so we do. We wish them a happy Thanksgiving. I um, Just very quickly, this is kind of a sidebar, but I... Um, I'm fascinated by sort of the underlying lattices of coincidence that that uh, exist in our reality. And the other night, I was watching on YouTube a um, uh, a special with the late um, country singer, um, the coal miner's daughter, of course. And I just Loretta, learned Loretta Lynn, I think, is it? Loretta Lynn, yes, Loretta Lynn. And I just learned. Uh, reading your biography, that you are a coal miner's daughter. So there you go. <laughs> I am indeed. And and my granddad, too, uh, was a coal miner. Oh, wow. Wow. Um, so let's begin with uh, when you were four years old, you, you had conversations with um, visitations from what you called discarnate entities. Uh, talk to me a little bit about that. Be happy to and, and I really want to put this in context Richard that this is not that unusual <laughs> not as for children you know my research for all my life has shown how common it is for young children to have such experiences and I was fortunate in that I didn't choose to share them with anyone even though I know my mum would have said okay that's fine I suspect the, the the community around me would have called them imaginary friends or poo-pooed them or whatever. And yet what they what those experiences did was open the door to a lifetime of engaging with and communicating with discarnate realms of, of, of existence and intelligence. And my life has been enriched enormously by that ongoing um, experiential realization that there's much more to the nature of reality than our, 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 our universe, wondrous though it is. And of course, I'm by no means the first person <laughs> to have such experiences. We're told stories throughout history, and I'm sure prehistory of, of, of this, because as we'll share, I'm sure, this is our natural state of being. You know, we are microcosms of a universe that does exist and evolve as a unified entity, and does so on multidimensional levels of reality. So my experiences, and I'm incredibly grateful for them, have offered me deep insights and powerful expressions and experiences of, of the, the even greater wonder of the nature of reality. I'm just trying to imagine how those experiences would have, I don't know, played out in, in the coal mining community. <laughs> I, I can't imagine. I can't imagine. I mean, it was weird enough that at the same time I was I was fascinated by astronomy, the stars. I was fascinated by quantum physics. So I gave my first lecture in quantum physics at the age of nine. And my audience were my mum's neighbours, <laughs> who she invited around and bribed with her very good chocolate cake and a cup of tea. <laughs> to listen to this precocious child I don't know what I said, but clearly it was something that, that got a round of applause at the end. <laughs> Ultimately, that led you to uh, Oxford University to discover physics. But then you also studied, uh, you received your, your 
PhD in archaeology. My, my wife trained as an archaeologist. I always joke that that's why she married me, because she likes <laughs> digging up old things. Bless, bless. <laughs> <laughs> well, it may seem they're very different in terms of their, their areas of expertise and study, but obviously be help, because I was having these multi-world experiences, I was walking between worlds from a very early age and was fascinated by the stars, by quantum physics. When I was 18, it, it, I, I chose to go to Oxford to do a master's degree in physics and specializing in quantum physics and cosmology. And I was the first member of my family to go to university at all. So it was a, it was a, a very big change from what I'd grown up. And what I was finding was what I had been experiencing since I was a little girl, I was not being taught at Oxford. The leading edge science was still teaching then, and to some degree still is, although it is changing, a paradigm of materialism and separation. So although it offered me um, a, a, a deep insight, a fascinating journey of, of, you know, to some degree how our universe is as it is, it was very much not the deeper perspective that I was seeking to really understand and which has taken me the last you know, period of my life ever since to, to come to that deeper point. But after a, after a, a corporate career that you kindly mentioned, um, I chose in the mid 90s to, to move beyond corporate life. And part of that, and it was only a small part of it in a sense, but I studied to do research and a PhD in archaeology, but it was it was anthropological archaeology. So it wasn't just about, it was about artifacts and, and all the, 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 you know, the more familiar archaeological studies, but it was actually researching ancient cosmologies. You know, cosmology is, is how we make meaning, how we understand our world and our place in it. So on the one hand was leading edge science to try and help us understand that. The other was ancient wisdom. And it was ancient wisdom that for me really gave me much deeper insights into what I was experiencing in the nature of reality, such as the ancient Vedic tradition of India and um, many of the ancient traditions and indigenous teachings were giving me a far deeper perception that correlated with what I'd been experiencing all my life. And so, my PhD wanted to delve even deeper into that perspective. So the study of the sacred sciences from our forebears, our ancestors, mm -hmm. um, you, you've talked about how we, we some, you know, we, we, we studied the sacred sciences for millennia. And then a couple hundred years ago, we, we took this different path where science focused almost exclusively on our physical reality. Why, why did we do that? <laughs> it's a good question. But as a, a student of history, I, I think there are a number of reasons that, that certainly help contribute to that. The first is that um, in the early 1600s, you had a situation where the church was the authority on, on the nature of, of reality per se. And yet people were coming to really be curious, not just about the sort of the speculative approaches to the nature of reality, but they wanted to experiment. They wanted to actually do, actually study in a way that was data-based, that was information-based, that was experimental-based, as well as observational. But rather than speculate, they wanted to, as you said, in your introduction to the show, to follow the evidence wherever it led. And so you had at the beginning of the 1600s, someone called Francis Bacon, who actually understood the entire perspective of reality from a deeply spiritual perspective, but also wanted to understand how sort of heaven and earth met, as it were, in, in, in doing experimentation and, and a, a scientific methodology to follow the possible evidence in, in the physical world. And so people like Isaac Newton, who came after, were natural philosophers. They didn't even call themselves scientists. They called themselves natural philosophers. But they, they wanted to follow that route too. And whilst hitherto the church had said no to anything that wasn't of the physical realm, these natural philosophers said, okay, well then we'll just follow where we're being led evidence-wise in the physical world. 
but it did start to move that sort of perception of separation between science and spirituality or science and the deeper nature of, of, of reality that doesn't need religion as such, but is but does absolutely involve non-physical discarnate realms of existence. And that process continued. And whereas I think Francis Bacon, who I do greatly respect as an amazing, insightful person, wanted to sort of just offer, just offer a methodology that was replicable. Um, in some cases, he's been sort of seen as, as quite a villain for sort of starting this road into materialism and separation. But that, in all the readings I've ever done of his in the original writings, because the original writings were in Latin, they were then later translated into French. But when they were translated into French, all the spiritual aspects, all those deeper perceptions were excised out of them. And then when they were translated into English, they came back as this materialism rather than the initial intention so i think that's sort of the journey and we're now to a point where we're at a point right when we've certainly you know un, you know benefited in an unimaginable ways from that focus yeah. on physical reality um are the two the sacred sciences and the hyper focused sciences on physical reality going to reconnect I think we are, you know, science really at its best is evidence based. It's evidence led and to go follow that evidence wherever it leads. And 100 years ago, of course, we had the quantum and relativity revolutions because experiments were being done and phenomena were being discovered that were anomalous to that older paradigm of, 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 of materialism and separation. But the material separate perspective had become such a predominant worldview by then, not just in science, but in our structures, organism, organizations, our education, um, our, all of this, that the deeper clues as to this more profound understanding of reality were pushed to the side. And what continued was more and more of a technological focus on what quantum physics and relativity had uncovered. But now we're at a point where we're discovering evidence across all scales of existence and across many different fields of research that that materialist separatist paradigm can no longer hold. And so we're realizing and needing to absolutely bring into a central focus what the quantum physicists and, and Einstein, you know, Max Planck and Einstein and many others realized was showing us something deeper about the nature of reality. And it was beyond physicalized energy matter and physicalized space time and now we're realizing that they indeed the appearance of our universe does indeed emerge from those deeper realms of, of non-physicalized causation which is converging with the universal wisdom teachings um and, and into a much deeper profound integral perspective of the nature of reality uh, and what was missing that the, the ephemeral quality of physical reality of matter in part i mean we've known that the the, the physical uh, reality is incredibly ephemeral when we dig down and down and down you know we've known for almost as long as the the 20th century scientific revolution that it's 99.9999 percent no thingness what was really missing was the acknowledgement of the centrality and the all pervasiveness of consciousness of co what Einstein would have referred to as cosmic mind, what, you know, different religious teachings uh, uh, describe as God or Allah or great mystery or great spirit. Whatever terminology we use, we're finding that indeed mind and consciousness aren't something we have. They are literally what we in the whole world are. So the whole of this emergent cosmological understanding is of a universe that exists and evolves as a unified entity, but where mind and consciousness are its all pervasive fundamental stuff and express itself, mind and consciousness, cosmic mind and consciousness, expressing itself as the appearance of our universe um, of energy, matter, space, time, but the deeper reality and the all encompassing reality 
is that of mind and consciousness. So when you say that the universe did not begin with a big bang, but a big breath, explain what you mean. This is me being a little bit facetious, as I know you appreciate. <laughs> um, it wasn't big. We know it was minute. It was at its tiniest form when it, it the first moment of space time, uh, you know, came into being 13.8 billion years ago. But if I was to ask you, Richard, when I say the word bang, what does what connotations, what comes to mind when I say bang? Well, this has always confounded me because first there was nothing and then it exploded. It, well, the 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 no thingness of it is is essentially um, a universe as a great thought emanating out of a cosmic plenum. So it's beginning we can start to have an appreciation of. But when you say bang and explosion, it, we know it wasn't. We we absolutely know it began in in an incredibly ordered state, um, incredibly fine tuned, utterly. In, not just interrelated, but unified with the laws of physics as informational uh, relational instructions for how it can then exist and continue to evolve. And so very much as the first moment of an ongoing big breath. So as space has expanded ever since, as time has flowed ever since, our universe is far more as a great thought rather than a great thing, but as a big breath of cosmic consciousness, which again harks back to the way in which it was described in the ancient Indian teachings as the breath of the great breath of Brahman, the creator God. So that's why I describe it thus. And 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 for many folks, A, it's more accurate, much more accurate than the idea of an initial Big Bang and then a random series of processes ever since. But it really sets the context of our universe as innately meaningful, existing meaningfully and purposefully evolving from simplicity to complexity ever since. Jude, we'll take a quick time out. We'll come back and uh, continue to delve into the story of Gaia. What would it feel like to reclaim your health, your vitality, to sleep deeply, to live fully, to address health at the root, at the cellular level, so that your body can detect damage where you have it? Imagine living younger, longer, having the energy to do what you want to do when you want to do it. Discomfort fading away. ASEA Redox Supplement harnesses the power of your body to heal itself, giving you the ability to power your potential. This is one of the most profound health, athletic, and anti-aging discoveries of our lifetime, and we need the world to know about it. If you want to learn more about ASEA, visit strangeplanet.com teamasia.com strangeplanet.teamasia.com and be sure to text or call my colleague and friend Lynn at 443-254-6024 443-254-6024 to order or for additional information ASEA Redox Supplement it's truly wellness Redefined. Welcome back. Dr. Jude Curvin stays with us. The story of Gaia. There it is, the brand new one. The big breath and the evolutionary journey of our conscious planet. Uh, so speaking about the nature of reality, the idea that our physical reality is indeed real. So what is the illusion then? Separation. You're absolutely right, Richard. Our, our physical reality is real. This isn't a simulation of some advanced technological ETs. But we are we are grounding ourselves now in cosmic awareness, cosmic mind, cosmic consciousness, with you, our universe and possibly many other universes. As uh, the eminent Edwardian uh, scientist Sir James Jean said, more a great thought than a great thing. So in that sense... And knowing now, as we do, with the evidence that I, I write about from many, many different researchers, this isn't just me sort of coming forward with this, this is many different researchers across many fields of research, are realising that our universe does indeed exist and evolve as what's called a non-locally unified entity. And non-locality was a concept that, was, that came into to, to perception 
um, at the time of the quantum revolution, because the quantum physicists were themselves realizing that you cannot separate an observer from what is observed, that to act for, to, for quantum physics to work at all, our universe has to be non-locally unified in its entirety. Within space-time, there's a, there's a cosmic speed cop, the speed of light. Nothing can go faster than that. There's no signal that can go faster than that in space-time. And that's vital because we couldn't be having this conversation if that wasn't the case. But they also found there was an and-and that for space-time as a whole, our entire universe is what's called non-locally connected. So it knows itself as an entirety in every moment. And in 2018, after researching and doing experiments that were sort of showing that such quantum locality, non-locality, was much larger than the quantum scale, we were able to show by uh, non-locally, what's called entangling, photons of light in a lab, with photons of light coming down a telescope 600 light years away, and then photons of light coming from an incredibly active uh, galactic uh, center called a quasar, 12.2 billion light years away, entangling those in the laboratory showed us the cosmological scale of our universal non-locality, which itself is the fundamental ability of our universe to exist and evolve as a unified entity. In a, in a unified, the idea of, uh, you know, non-duality and we are, we are one and, and unified even in our consciousness, where is the individual in all of that? Crucial, vital. Unity is not uniformity. Our universe, although it does exist and evolve as a non-local and unified entity, its unity is expressed in radical diversity. You know, from that very first moment of the big breath, when atoms, you know, in formation became um, accumulated and expressed as the energy matter of our universe, from that very first few moments and the simplicity of hydrogen and then moving to helium and all the way through uh, primarily then hundreds of millions of years later in stars, this, this alchemy of ever greater complex elements with different attributes and yet themselves resonant and harmonically connected and structured in such a way that they could relate with each other and, and, and take complexity even further into molecules and into stellar dust clouds, almost to the edge of biological complexity and then the formation of planetary systems such as ours, and then even greater complexity into single cell, multi-celled, all of this incredible abundance that we experience on our beloved planetary home Gaia. That is our universe as unity in radical diversity. And of course, with us as self-aware beings, every one of us unique, all of us part of a human family, all of us part of an even greater community of sentience we call our planetary home Gaia, and all of us together as part of our incredible universe and a multidimensional universe where we've hardly really begun to explore what it means if we can wake up to remember we're inseparable and consciously evolve into that, what I see as the invitation of our universe and Gaia to become co-evolutionary partners with that ongoing evolutionary impulse to evolve. Uh, information. Let's talk about information <laughs> because uh, yes. you say that we should restate the laws of physics as laws of information. I want to get to that in a moment. But first of all, why do you put a hyphen in uh, between in and formation? In hyphen formation. And it's not because I'm obsessed with hyphens, although that might be part of <laughs> That might be part of it. I wanted to differentiate between information can actually be gobbledygook. You know, we have an English alphabet of 26 letters, A, B, C, D, and on. Of themselves, each, each alphabet 
each each letter of the alphabet doesn't have any meaning. It's only when we bring them together into 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 words and sentences and poetry and song and books and all the rest of it, we make meaning of those twenty six letters of the alphabet. And our universe is not randomly gobbledygook information, even though its alphabet, its universal alphabet, is actually digitized letters, ones and zeros. We can go into that. But again, just as in our, our communications, our digitized technologies, we take objects, names, visuals, sounds, and we we transcribe them into long columns of ones and zeros, which of themselves describe a leaf, a tree, a song, a person. And then we squirt them down cables and recombine them into that original image object, whatever it may be, our universe uses just two letters, ones and zeros, not like our English alphabet with 26, but from that, it meaningful, meaningfully combines them as, as, at, as, 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 as nucleons, as atoms, as molecules, as planets, as, uh, uh, as plants, as people. So that's why I put the hyphen in to really keep banging on about this is not meaningless information. This is not random data. We are microcosmic co-creators of a, a, a universe of innate meaning and meaningful purpose. So the ones and zeros that you alluded to, that would be the cosmic hologram? That would be the language of the cosmic hologram, yes, because we, coming from the study of black holes and the informational uh, understanding of black holes, we realize that when a massive star comes to the end of its lifetime, it can't, you know, it's gone through all its fuel, it's, its nuclear fuel, it collapses in on itself, but it's so massive that nothing can hold back that gravitational collapse. And it collapses between, and the star itself is spherical, so at the end of its life, it, it collapses spherically and goes within what's called an event horizon, within which it continues to collapse, but nothing, not, not even light can escape. There's a slight smidge in that, but not even light can escape. So that event horizon surrounds a sort of an area, a spherical area that is black, hence the black hole. But when we research, well, what happens to all that information within that star? We'd think intuitively, just as the information perhaps in a book that the informational content will be um, proportional to the volume of the book. Yeah? Right. It's not. The information of a black hole is proportional to the surface area, the spherical surface area of that event horizon of the black hole. So we start to go, well, aha, what could this mean? And of course, that's what holograms do. We take a beam of light, we bounce it off a 3D, an apparently three-dimensional object. We collect the information back. We then arraign that information on a two-dimensional patterned plate. We then beam more light through that patterning and a projection, a 3D projection of that original object is created that we call a hologram. So when we as cosmologists expanded that research, that understanding of black hole information to the whole of the universe, the holographic principle, as it's called, posits that the entire three-dimensional appearance of our universe, four-dimensional space and time, our entire four-dimensional uh, appearance of our universe is a projection of intelligent information, cosmic consciousness, as the three-dimensional space and one-dimensional time of our universe. So a two-dimensional boundary, one of space, one of time. And that then, as our universe expands, as space expands and time flows forward, it's that boundary of the appearance of our universe, which is the, the hologram, the cosmic hologram, from which all that we call our physical reality is projected into its realness, but not into a separation. We'll take another time out, Dr. Jude Curivan. The story of Gaia stays with us. What would it feel like to reclaim your health, your vitality, to sleep deeply, to live fully, 
to address health at the root, at the cellular level, so that your body can detect damage where you have it. Imagine living younger, longer, having the energy to do what you want to do when you want to do it. Discomfort fading away. ASEA Redox Supplement harnesses the power of your body to heal itself, giving you the ability to power your potential. This is one of the most profound health, athletic, and anti-aging discoveries of our lifetime, and we need the world to know about it. If you want to learn more about ASEA, visit strangeplanet.teamasea.com, strangeplanet.teamasea.com, and be sure to text or call my colleague and friend Lynn at 443-254-6024, 443-254-6024 to order or for additional information. ASEA Redox Supplement. It's truly wellness redefined. We're here with Dr. Jude Curvin. There is the book, the new one, The Story of Gaia. How do we get a copy? Richard, thank you. Um, any good bookseller, um, the publisher in the traditions or Amazon. Um, the book's just come out in the States and Canada on Amazon and will be out in the UK and Europe on the 8th of December, but folks can pre-order it now. So we were talking about information mm -hmm. in hyphen formation and uh, you were talking about, you know, restating the laws of physics as laws of information, as algorithms. These are the, the instructions that uh, enable our universe to exist and evolve. Can you give me some examples? I mean, where, where do we see this, these algorithms or this signature at play in both the man-made world and the, the, the natural physical world? Well, certainly in terms of signature, we find that because everything is in relationship to everything else, for some time now, when uh, research has been studying complex systems, they've realized that although they may not uh, embody the idealized geometry of the ancient Greek geometers, that they do embody geometries innately embodied geometries, and they're called fractals. And we find them at many, many scales from atoms to, in fact, our entire universe. In 2017, the fractal signature um, of the cosmic hologram, because this is a characteristic of, of holograms too, the fractal signature of, of the cosmic hologram was discovered in what's called the cosmic microwave background, which is relic radiation from the very uh, very early epoch of our, our universe, and so fills the whole of space. So we find these fractal signatures all the way through from atoms to uh, the scale of, of, of our planetary homes, so coastlines, clouds, weather patterns, ecosystems. They pervade our collective behaviors. When analysis of the internet was done fairly early on, because now it's so vast, it, it, you know, supercomputer on supercomputer to do it, but it was shown that the nodal points, the backbone of the internet, the way that the internet comes together, embodies exactly the same fractal patterns as does ecosystems. The way that we collectively behave does so too. And of course, because of that, um, internet companies, data companies, understand this and therefore use those algorithms based on these patterns to effectively predict our collective and personal but collective behaviors but the other side of it when i talk about the laws of physics um there are three laws that are really fundamental um to the understanding of of our physical reality and they are the laws of thermodynamics but the laws of thermodynamics speak to energy and matter and they speak to how systems of energy and matter embody a concept called entropy which is the number of the microstates in such a system by restating as we can do those laws of thermodynamics as laws of infodynamics we find something very simple and very remarkable we find that the first law of infodynamics expanded describes information expressed as energy matter as quantized energy matter so it's the simplest way we can actually describe quantum physics and the second law of thermodynamics when we span to infodynamics helps us understand the description of space and time 
as being innately informed in a complementary way. And that gives us another insight into the law of relativity. But by doing that for those two laws of thermo to infodynamics, we can see how quantum physics and relativity physics, by treating them informationally, can be reconciled. And that's something that's been attempted for nearly 100 years. The third law, which is rather beautiful, shows that the temperature of a system, like our universe, is in inverse proportion to its informational content, which we're now re-describing the sense of entropy, the concept of entropy as the informational content of our universe. So by going back to that first moment of big breath, at the highest temperature our universe will be and the lowest informational content, we can see how a space has expanded and time has flowed ever since. That as the temperature's reduced, the information contents increase. So we have a whole life cycle process for our universe that can naturally embody its journey from simplicity to complexity and ever greater levels of embodied experience and thus informational content. So it just, it just like a, a Rubik's cube, which I could never handle. This is much simpler than a Rubik's cube. It just all comes together and we have this understanding of a meaningful, purposeful, unified, conscious universe. I just want to go back uh, to the idea that there is, there is this apparent signature we see both in the man-made world and man uh, human behavior and natural ecosystems. Uh, you compared a couple of interesting studies. One was the, the uh, destructive power and the frequency of earthquakes and also how that is mirrored in the destructive power and the frequency of human conflicts. That for me was one of the most profound ahas, and that I speak of in the Cosmic Hologram, the, the, the previous book to the story of Gaia. Because yes, indeed, we see that when we when researchers were trying to understand and therefore predict earthquakes, there was a hope that there would be something that is an average earthquake that could have an equation around it that could help prediction. But when the frequency of earthquakes are graphed against the destructive power in a logarithmic scale, which we commonly know as the Richter scale, instead of a sort of a peak at an average earthquake, um, the distribution was along a long line, a straight line. So the only relationship between the frequency of an earthquake and its destructive power was that bigger earthquakes are less frequent. And it's about, you know, so a, a, an earthquake with twice the destructive power in logarithmic terms was four times less likely to happen. Now, there are other ways that we can sort of get a, a bit of a look at earthquakes, but there's no easy way other than that appreciation of that innate relationship. They're all unique. They're individuals. They're unique. They're, they're exactly that. It's just more powerful ones are less likely to happen. We find exactly the same in looking at conflicts. Um, uh, at the end of the Second World War, there was an analysis of numerous conflicts going around back several centuries. And then more latterly, uh, at the University of Miami, there have been studies of insurgencies in Iraq and Afghanistan. And again, we see the same pattern when we plot the frequency of conflicts against the destructive power in terms of fatalities, we see them aligned, whether it's world wars or regionals, uh, you know, uh, conflicts along that same path. Slightly different pitch, but it's very much the same relationship. And that's because underlying the appearance of our physical world are what's called attractor basins, of information and they underpin weather patterns, they underpin complex systems, they underpin our collective behaviors. And so what we're finding is that if our collective perceptions is of a worldview of separation, then in a way conflicts are natural outcomes and they band within, as all our behaviors do, they band within an array of behaviors that reflect that. What we find from the whole story of the evolutionary process of Gaia is that as we move from simplicity to complexity, 
there are higher level attractor basins of complexity. So with us waking up to remember we're inseparable within this wondrous, intelligent, conscious and evolutionary universe, we're actually beginning to potentize the next evolutionary attractor in our awareness, where instead of conflicts being a natural outcome of our perception separation, then peace is a natural outcome of our perception of unity in diversity. So as this attractor basin that we're currently uh, existing or um, dealing with, let's say, uh, what is likely to to cause that to sort of fall away and 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 allow us to create this new uh, attractor basin? It is falling away, isn't it? Because we've got to a point because of that journey of of a worldview of materialism and separation. You know, we've we've behaved accordingly with each other and with our planetary home. We've come to a point of of utter unsustainability. So it is the center cannot hold. It is falling away. And that we've seen throughout the whole story of Gaia. There's as the old has come to the end of an evolutionary arc of whatever that has meant, it has broken down. But as its breakdown, a new higher level order of, of complexity has has come forward. And we find this. In, in, you know, the, an example is, is, is insect and, and biological metamorphosis. For, for, a, for a caterpillar to metamorphize into a butterfly, it moves into crisis. It moves into a crisis where it can't eat anymore. Its environment can't offer it anymore. It goes into a cocoon. And in that cocoon, it breaks down. The old literally dissolves. But in that dissolution what's called the imaginal cells of the butterfly are starting to form. And as they do, the old is, is dying away. It can't sustain, it can't hold. It sort of fights against what's coming forth, but that makes the butterfly stronger. So at the end of that process, when the butterfly is ready, it breaks out of the cocoon and it flies. And instead of being a rapacious eater, and I'm not judging caterpillars, I'm really not... <laughs> But instead of sort of eating everything it can in its environment, which is pretty much the way we've behaved, a butterfly is a pollinator. It spreads abundance from flower to flower, from plant to plant in great beauty. And again, I'm, I'm not doing, you know, great for butterflies and isn't it awful for caterpillars. But I'm just saying that in the whole story of Gaia and Gaia as a planetary home, that journey from simplicity to complexity has been one of project, you know, pr 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 continuing um, ever greater levels of self-awareness. And those arcs into complexity have absolutely been embodied in cooperation. So Gaia collaborates. She's collaborated as a planetary home for over 4 billion years. But that collaboration sometimes can be creative tensions and competitive tensions. But whenever there's been a move to greater complexity, from single cell to multi celled and on and on and on, throughout her entire Gaia sphere, that has always been as a result of cooperation. So I think at this point, this potential waking up to remember who we really are offers us this incredible opportunity to come together, to evolve together and undertake this next chapter of this incredible journey of a universe, a planetary home and us, perhaps to think of ourselves now and experience ourselves now beyond humans as Gaians. I think this is the invite that we're being called and invited to join. So despite all of the chaos in the world right now, this, to use this butterfly analogy, is, is just part of our metamorphosis. And ultimately, this is, a, this is kind of a hopeful time. If we choose, yes. If we choose to stay in the illusion of separation, more and more fear, more and more fragmentation are natural outcomes of that. If we, however, do, and I believe we are doing, 
and more and more folks are doing, waking up and doing that work on an inner level as well. You know, the inner connection with the wholeness of our of, of all that is, as well as the outer linking up and lifting up. Yes, this is a, an extraordinary hopeful time. And it is our choice as to which we will choose, which direction we will choose to go. The story of Gaia. One more time, Dr. Curvin, how do we get a copy? Um, my publisher, Inner Traditions, who are an excellent publisher and have other wonderful books. Um, Amazon.com in the US, Canada, books already available uh, in December the 8th, UK, Europe. Uh, Pre-order it now. Uh, any good any good bookstores. Jude, a real pleasure. Thank you so much for spending some time with me. Richard, it's been my deep and great pleasure. Thank you. A new Richard Serrett's Strange Planet drops every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Subscribe at strangeplanetpodcast.com.